So we're given a, a gander at the church versus Israel, the study I did on that, which is other uh, theolog theologians have really helped me on this one, a number of them, very specific, like Renald Showers, Zane Hodges, Robert Wilkin, and a number of others, put together that study. <clears throat> That's so essential to understand dispensations and how God operates. We're going to point B, the second indispensable factor and what is this? What factor are we talking about? So we get reminded of the context. Indispensable factors of dispensational theology. We looked at the first one, the recognition of the distinction between the nation of Israel and the church. And I did a separate study on this. Excellent points in this study and the next. The second indispensable factor is the consistent use of a single hermeneutic a single method of interpreting the Bible. Of course, my idea is you don't want to be over the top of other people's heads. Only a few get, get how to interpret the Bible. I maintain all you do is read it properly. Language, context, and logic. Start at the beginning. Take notes. Uh, now you got 66 beginnings. How come? you got 66 books. Some are interrelated. Uh, for example, the book of Luke covers Jesus' ministry in his perfect humanity. Thereafter, in the book of Acts, the church. <laughs> and it transitions over that way very nicely. <coughs> so, the single method of interpreting the Bible, namely, Renald Showers calls it the historical grammatical method. Well, you get the history out of it, and you get the grammar out of it by simply reading it properly, so it doesn't put the Bible out of reach, but for a few experts in knowing this special hermeneutics, isagogics, category, etymology, and exegesis. Actually, you want to find out what a word means, etymology? Get a Webster's Dictionary. You want to find out what words mean in sentences? Go to school. Get your grammar books. Then practice your reading skills, develop your vocabulary. Anyway, showers indicates. In this method, words are given a common ordinary meaning, oh, there you go, which they had in the culture and the time in which the passage was written. And in a good translation, we use the good translation. Most of the time, concepts aren't unique to one particular civilization or group of people. And when there are uh, a, a little custom made, for that particular time or people, it's no big deal because you can explain it in, for example, modern 21st century American English. So as noted earlier, covenant theology employs a double hermeneutic, the historical grammatical method for many passages, but also the allegorical or a spiritualizing method of a number of prophetic passages dealing with the future of Israel and the future kingdom of God. But who's to make up those rules? See? However, in order for the Bible to have an absolutely consistent interpretation throughout, without contradiction, one which is within the reach of every individual, only the normative method of language interpretation should be used, the historical grammatical method, proper approach to Scripture. Let's take a look at that. Proper approach to Scripture. Proper approach to interpreting Scripture. The Bible is to be interpreted by the normative rules of language, context, and logic as we all learned in school and develop that skill set as we go along. Trying not to be anything but observing and reporting what you observe. Don't read into it. Very, very difficult for people to do that because there are advantages to interpreting in your way depending upon how you get away with it. So the normative rules <clears throat> as defined relative to the Bible and everything that you read are the normally expected meanings using the established rules of the language, context, and logic of a passage from the Bible. Or the newspaper. Just, you know, the newspaper may get it wrong, but you don't correct it 
You just observe and report. Now, you may want to comment and say, this is what it says, but I don't agree, and here's why. Two, faithfully and accurately adhering to the knowing the rules of language, context, and logic results in the most trustworthy, non-contradicting, immutable, consistent interpretation of passages in the Bible and elsewhere. This is proof of the validity of this method of interpreting the Bible. Now, the words of the original Bible were written in specific languages at specific times, <coughs> languages in which many thousands of manuscripts were carefully preserved, copied, so that the meanings of those words, verses, and passages in the original Bible could be frozen in time and then could be accurately interpreted and translated into languages of the world for all ages via the normative rules of language, context, and logic of each and every language. Otherwise, one could impose what he wished upon the Bible, and many do, due to their ever-changing nature of languages. So, a particular word used in a particular time in God's original word in a particular context will only have one meaning and not be subject to change as languages change. Now, a lot of times, languages may change. Like you have 1611 English, King James English. Then you have the modern 21st century, 22nd century English. So, you have King James Version, and then the, uh, the modern language, like New American Standard, New King James Version Bibles, they reflect, but you read the two, you have an eye on the dictionary and the grammar book of Shakespeare in English when you read the King James Version, but you pretty much know what things mean in the 22nd century English because that's how we learn in school. Since the interpretation point four of any passage in the Bible via the proper use of the normative rules of language, context, and logic, proves itself to be the most trustworthy, non-contradictory, immutable, consistent interpretation of passages in the Bible, then the interpretation by these rules will not be something that can be changed or modified into something different by information derived elsewhere in the Bible or outside of the Bible, as some contend. On the other hand, the normative rules permit referral to parallel passages when they are stipulated or referred to by the author in order to define specific words or the context of a passage at hand. And parallel passages, normatively interpreted, may also be used to corroborate the meaning of a passage at hand, but not change it. So in order for the Bible to be properly interpreted by the normative rules of language, context, and logic, inductive reasoning, rather than deductive reasoning, must prevail. And we look at deductive and inductive. Inductive is you allow the information build up as the author wrote it. D doctor is you try to guess, do a little guesswork and cut short the uh, the time it takes to read. But that's not a good idea. You, if you corroborate it, but you better finally corroborate it using the inductive build up a foundation reasoning uh, and method. So a deductive approach to the Bible means presupposition and can often result in a bad interpretation unless the inductive approach is allowed to prevail to support or refute the clues arrived at through the external deductive approach. You can go on in this study. Excellent. All it is, is what did you learn and how did you learn to read in school? So, point C. The third indispensable factor is the recognition that the ultimate purpose of history is the glory of God through the demonstration that he alone is the sovereign God. And you know what? There is no other religious book like it, no other thought processes by which you come across, oh, who, how did everything get here? How did everything get created? The best possible explanation is right there available in the Bible. And then... I've done a number of researches. I did a 500-page study on the scientific approach to whether creation was evolving and had evolved or whether there was a, a designer and who bets which book and which idea best fits that scientific approach. The Bible, again. Showers goes, as noted earlier, covenant theology advocates advocates that the ultimate purpose of history is the glory of God through the redemption of the elect. By contrast, although dispensational theology recognizes that the redemption of elect human beings is a very important part of God's purpose for history, it is convinced that it is the only, only one part of that purpose. I note there, it is evident in Scripture that there are other programs which God is carrying out. For example, God's program relative to angels, 
to not elect humans and to the universe. Thus, the ultimate purpose of history has to be large enough to incorporate all of God's programs, not just one of them. Dispensational theology proposes that the glory of God, through the demonstration that he alone is the sovereign God, and scientifically, that's logical, is the only purpose capable of doing this. It is only convinced that the scriptures indicate that this is the ultimate purpose of history. We have footnotes, and we're done.